Pathophysiology and Diagnosis of Heart Failure by Dr. Christina Vanderplum. Hello, my name is Dr. Christina Vanderplum and I am the Director of the Ventricular Assist Device Program in the Heart Transplant and Heart Function Program at Boston Children's Hospital. And today I'm going to discuss heart failure in children. In this two-part series, we're going to first start with the pathophysiology and diagnosis of heart failure in infants and children. We're going to start with the causes of heart failure in infants and children. We're going to follow with the classification and staging, then look at the clinical manifestations of heart failure in infants and children, and finally end with a diagnosis, which consists of the initial evaluation followed by further evaluation. Causes of heart failure. So there are three main causes of heart failure in infants and children, starting with ventricular pump dysfunction, otherwise known as systolic dysfunction. So when we consider the heart with two ventricles or even with some of the complex congenital anatomies with only single ventricles, the heart functionally is a pump. And if the pump has any dysfunction, then you're going to have a decrease in cardiac output, as well as sequelae of backup of all that pressure that results in pulmonary and systemic venous congestion. Another cause of heart failure in infants and children is volume overload. And this can occur in the setting of both preserved ventricular function as well as in settings of ventricular dysfunction. This is otherwise known as increased preload, when there's just an additional amount of volume within the heart. And these have physiological consequences of backing up of this fluid into both the lungs as well as your systemic venous circulation as well. The last is pressure overload. And this can occur once again in the setting of preserved ventricular function or in the setting of ventricular dysfunction. This is otherwise known as increased afterload or increased pressure that the heart must work against. So starting with ventricular pump dysfunction, we categorize it into both structurally normal hearts and then congenital abnormality of hearts. So in considering structurally normal hearts, we have cardiomyopathies of which there's dilated, hypertrophic, restrictive, non-compaction, and arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Now these different types of cardiomyopathies just describe the appearance of the heart. Dilated cardiomyopathies are those where the heart itself is dilated and enlarged. Generally, the, the wall of the ventricle is thinned out. And associated with the dilation of the ventricle, you get stretching of the annulus, resulting in either tricuspid or mitral regurgitation, which further exacerbates the dilation and the dysfunction. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you actually have preserved size of the ventricle. And if anything, the ventricle cavity becomes small because of hypertrophy or thickening of both the ventricular free walls and the septum. This hypertrophy is generally more pronounced in the left than the right. However, you can get cases of biventricular hypertrophy. The most severe cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy result in significant left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which can have disastrous consequences of complete cessation of blood flow out of the heart, which can result in either syncope or ventricular arrhythmias. Another cause of uh, ventricular dysfunction is restrictive cardiomyopathies. This is a unique case of cardiomyopathy in which the systolic function, i.e. the pumping of the heart, is actually preserved. However, the relaxation of the heart is dramatically impaired. This impairment and relaxation results in a buildup in pressure in the ventricle, which is then transduced into the atriums. If it's in the left ventricle, this pressure is then transduced into the pulmonary vasculature, which can result in pulmonary edema and pulmonary vascular congestion. And this presents clinically as significant tachypnea and inability to tolerate any dramatic changes in their volume status. If it presents on the right side, it results in systemic venous congestion, which manifests as enlarged organs such as hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. Ultimately, the appearance of the heart is very abnormal because the ventricles stay of relatively normal size. However, the atriums dilate dramatically to accommodate the increased pressure. And so the appearance of the heart is that of a mushroom. Another cause of cardiomyopathy is non-compaction. Non-compaction is also a unique cardiomyopathy in that embryologically, the myocardium did not compact down, as the name states, non-compaction. And it appears very spongy and dysfunctional. It's a spectrum of a disorder in which there are certain cases that are dramatic and very severe where the ventricle itself is completely disorganized versus more subtle cases where it just appears more spongy with increased trabeculations. And lastly, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia is a type of cardiomyopathy that more than often affects the right ventricle with a pronounced arrhythmia, a ventricular arrhythmia of the right ventricle. There are also acquired causes of ventricular dysfunction, myocarditis being the most common. 
Myocarditis is an infection and inflammation of the myocardium, as the name states. It can be either due to viral, bacterial, or rheumatological abnormalities. There are also certain immunological features that play a role in myocarditis. And then there are arrhythmogenic causes. So persistent arrhythmias, such as ventricular or supraventricular arrhythmias, can cause abnormalities and dysfunction of the myocardium that persist even after cessation of the arrhythmia. And then there's ventricular pump dysfunction with congenital heart disease. There are a multitude of complex congenital heart diseases in which the myocardium itself may be dysfunctional. There are also complex congenital heart disease that have undergone surgical repairs or palliations, and following these palliations and repairs, there may be induced um, dysfunction secondary to the repair itself or due to the cardiopulmonary bypass. Now, as many children are getting palliated with even more and more complex anatomy, we are seeing children who are growing up with single ventricle circulations who have undergone a multitude of different surgeries who later in life also can develop ventricular dysfunction. The second cause of heart failure in infants and children can be attributed to volume overload, i.e. increased preload. And this occurs primarily in, situ in two situations of congenital heart disease. First, left to right shunting. There are a multitude of different um, anatomical defects that can result in left to right shunting. Large ventricular septal defects, patent ductus arteriosus, large atrial septal defects, aortal pulmonary windows, atrioventricular septal defects, and single ventricle circulation with unobstructed pulmonary blood flow will all result in increased volume load to the ventricle. In these circumstances, the ventricle must accommodate this increased volume by increasing its ability to squeeze or its systolic function. It also increases its systolic function through increasing its heart rate. This results in tachycardia. Now, in circumstances where the ventricular function is not normal, its ability to compensate by increasing its squeeze is impaired, and as such, it must compensate by increasing its heart rate. And so you see a disproportionate amount of tachycardia in these patients. Another cause of volume overload is valvular regurgitation. So this occurs in the setting of aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, and pulmonary regurgitation, where once again, there's increased volume that goes backwards back into the ventricle. The third cause of heart failure in infants and children is pressure overload, or increased afterload. Once again, this is a circumstance where the ventricle must now press or contract against higher afterload pressures, or more distal pressures. This can occur on both the left and the right side of the heart. Left-sided lesions include aortic stenosis, or coarctation of the aorta, where you have a fixed obstruction against which the left side of the heart must contract in order to extract blood out of the heart. And then there's right-sided lesions, such as pulmonary stenosis. Classification and staging. Now let's move on to classifications and staging of heart failure. In order to fully appreciate the degree of heart failure, you must have some sort of system in which to identify and classify patients into the severity of their heart failure symptoms. Over time, there have been a multitude of different classification systems of heart failure. And because heart failure is a much more common problem in adults than in children, the majority of our classification systems were initially extracted from adult studies. The most well-known classification system for heart failure is that of the New York Heart Association class system, classes 1 through 4. The classification system is actually relatively simple, with class 1 patients being the least severe and class 4 patients being the most severe. Class 1 patients are generally those who have really no symptoms at all. These are patients who are able to conduct most physical activities with little to no exertion and no symptoms. So class two patients are those who only have slight limitations of physical activity. These patients are generally comfortable at rest and complete most physical activities with minimal to no symptoms at all. Class three patients are those who have marked um, limitations with physical activity. These are patients who are comfortable at rest. However, less than ordinary activity will cause symptoms affect fatigue, palpitation, shortness of breath, or anginal pain. Now class four patients are the most severe. These are patients who have symptoms that may be present even at rest and that their symptoms are aggravated with even minimal activity. 
These types of patients generally require more advanced cardiac therapies, such as IV medications, including diuretics and inotropes, and these are patients who we may consider even for heart transplantation or mechanical circulatory support. Because children require a different classification, the Ross classification was created. This classification primarily was used for infants and small children who cannot exhibit their symptoms as clearly as adults. Once again, similar to the New York Heart Association class system, class 1 are the least severe patients and class 4 are the most severe patients. Class 1 patients would be asymptomatic. Class 2 patients may have mild symptoms such as shortness of breath or diaphoresis with feeding, but would otherwise be comfortable at rest. Older children may also have shortness of breath when they're doing some mild activities. Class 3 patients may have marked tachypnea or diaphoresis with feeding in small children. They also may have prolonged feeding times and an inability to grow with failure to thrive. Older children may exhibit symptoms of marked shortness of breath on exertion with activity. And class 4 patients, similar to the New York Heart Association classification, will have marked symptoms even at rest, such as tachypnea, shortness of breath, on exertion, and in infants and small children with feeding. Another way to look at heart failure is in stages. Many patients may progress through stages over time, starting with least severe stages and then progressing to more end-stage forms of heart failure where advanced therapies are required. Different stages of heart failure require different interventions and different treatments, and so organizing heart failure in this manner is helpful in considering therapeutic strategies. In this system, which was adopted from the America Heart Association, we look at four stages, with stage A consisting of patients who may have an underlying risk of cardiac disease, but who currently have no signs or symptoms of heart failure. An example of this type of patient may be a child who is exposed to a chemotherapy, which is known to cause some form of chemotoxicity-induced cardiomyopathy. That said, this patient would exhibit no symptoms of heart failure at this time and on echocardiogram may have normal cardiac function. Another example of this would be a patient in whom there is a family history of a genetic cardiomyopathy but at this time exhibits no symptoms or evidence of cardiac dysfunction. Most stage A patients only require increased surveillance and monitoring over time but no therapeutic interventions. Stage B patients are those with functional heart disease or anatomic heart disease. However, they currently have no symptoms of heart failure. Some of these patients may have a decrease in their ventricular function. However, they exhibit no signs or symptoms of heart failure as evidenced by normal vital signs and a normal growth velocity. Stage C patients are patients with structural or functional heart disease who have had in the past or who currently do have signs and symptoms of heart failure. And finally, stage D are patients with end-stage heart failure. In considering the stages of heart failure, one can look at the different therapeutic strategies that can be used at each stage. For stage A, these are patients who have potential exposure or increased risk of heart disease but who have currently no evidence of ventricular dysfunction or signs and symptoms of a heart failure, these patients would only warrant increased surveillance and observation over time, but no actual therapies. Stage B patients could potentially benefit from medications such as an ACE inhibitor if they had systemic ventricular dysfunction. An example of this type of patient would be someone with a mild cardiomyopathy, be it dilated or other familial types of cardiomyopathies, in which their ventricular function may be mildly impaired, but they exhibit no signs and symptoms of heart failure. The role of an ACE inhibitor is to decrease the afterload such that the heart must work less and consume less oxygen in order to push against, low, against those afterload pressures. The goal of this would be to prevent maladaptive fibrosis as well as other maladaptive sympathetic activation that occur in more advanced forms of heart failure. Stage C patients may require more medications. This is because these patients not only exhibit functional or anatomic heart disease, but they also have symptoms. Some of these medications could include ACE inhibitors, aldosterone antagonist, and beta blockers for the positive benefits of reverse remodeling, but also low-dose digoxin and diuretics for symptomatic relief. And lastly, stage D patients are those with end-stage heart failure, who not only have significant functional heart disease, but who are um, symptomatic due to that heart disease. 
These patients need not only medical therapy, but may go on to require more invasive therapies such as positive pressure ventilation, mechanical circulatory support, and even heart transplantation. Clinical Manifestations Now let's move on to the clinical manifestations of heart failure. Heart failure can present in a variety of different ways. And since we're considering infants all the way up to adolescents, its presentation can be very variable. The most important thing to start with in considering the clinical manifestation is the history. You may get a very varied history depending on the age of the patient, and it's important to ask specific questions that are age appropriate for the patient. In infants, a common presentation of heart failure is tachypnea, poor feeding, and di diaphoresis. Their inability to feed adequately results in poor weight gain, and as such, many of these patients present with failure to thrive in cachexia. In younger children, their presentation can be very variable, and at many times, heart failure is mistaken for either a viral syndrome or for asthma. Signs and symptoms can include uh, malaise, fatigue, vomiting, GI pain, and recurrent cough. In older children, once again, many symptoms of heart failure can be mistaken for viral symptoms or for asthma. They usually present with exercise intolerance, abdominal pain, recurrent vomiting, wheezing, cough, edema, and palpitations. The physical exam is also a very important aspect of identifying heart failure and trying to stage its severity. Signs can include tachycardia, tachypnea, diminished pulses such as cool extremities that can appear mottled, and hypotension. On cardiac auscultation, you may also hear an S3, otherwise known as a gallop, which is secondary to volume and pressure overload. Signs of pulmonary congestion include wheeze, rails, tachypnea, and there can also be signs and symptoms of systemic venous congestion, which include edema, generally pedal edema in older children, and ascites or abdominal distension in younger children. Diagnosis. Moving on to the diagnosis, generally we first start with a more thorough initial evaluation and depending on the results of the initial evaluation, we can then move on to further tests. The initial evaluation not only consists of the history and the physical exam, but also some investigations such as the chest radiography. Chest x-ray is important in identifying cardiomegaly, which may be evident in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Increased pulmonary vascular markings, which can be a sign of pulmonary congestion or left atrial hypertension, and biatrial enlargement. Biatrial enlargement is evident in patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy who have atrial dilation due to the increased pressure in the ventricles. The electrocardiogram can also be helpful in identifying heart block or increased voltages, which is evident in patients with hypertrophy. Decreased voltages is also seen in patients with myocardial edema or effusion, which is evidenced in patients with myocarditis, as well as seeing ST segment changes. The echocardiogram is likely your most helpful diagnostic tool in heart failure. Not only will it provide a complete anatomical survey of the patient, it also can provide a functional assessment of both the right and the left ventricle. Blood tests include a complete blood count to assess for any evidence of anemia or even compensatory increase in hematocrit, which may be seen in patients with chronic low output or cyanosis, serum electrolyte abnormalities, blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine for evidence of any renal dysfunction, and liver function tests. Additional blood tests include troponin, creatinine kinase, and C-reactive proteins. These are inflammatory markers, as well as markers that are directly released by the myocardium. They can be helpful in the identification of myocarditis or other inflammatory-induced myocardial diseases. Another important biomarker is brain natriuretic peptide, otherwise known as BNP. BNP has been extensively evaluated in the adult population as a sensitive and specific biomarker for patients with heart failure. It can correlate with the severity of the disease with an increase in BNP correlating with patients with worse ejection fraction and more severe heart failure symptoms. 
is utility in the pediatric population is expanding greatly. And there are a multitude of studies that now show that BNP can be used as a very important diagnostic tool in deciphering and discriminating patients with heart failure symptoms versus other types of respiratory diseases such as asthma or restrictive pulmonary disease. Following the initial evaluation, there are further modalities to identify the cause as well as characterize the severity of heart failure. These include magnetic resonance imaging that can not only help with identifying complex anatomy and understanding ventricular dimensions and function, but can also have more sophisticated uh, tests which can look at distinguishing types of cardiomyopathies such as restrictive from constriction, identifying um, edema or hyperemia which is commonly seen in patients with myocarditis, having a better evaluation of RV function, as well as characterizing the degree of myocardial fibrosis with a type of imaging such as late gadolinium MRI. Cardiac catheterization is also a helpful test in the armamentarium of identifying and characterizing heart failure. Not only does this help identify the etiology of heart failure by doing an RV endomyocardial biopsy that can be then sent for histology and genetic testing, but direct hemodynamic measurement of pressures within the heart allows for calculation of systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance as well as determination and direct measurement of cardiac output. So this concludes the pathophysiology and diagnosis of heart failure in children and infants. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.